Uh, thank you, Keith. I uh, appreciate that introduction. Um, as he said today, I'm going to talk about um, what we've learned in a few studies and three studies we did uh, to refine mountain pine beetle attraction uh, tools in the expanded range of mountain pine beetle in Alberta. So pheromones can be used as a monitoring tool for mountain pine beetle because it is uh, important for a number of stages of uh, life history for mountain pine beetle. The colonization phase during which beetles bore into the bark of selected trees is characterized by rapid infestation triggered by aggregation pheromones. Uh, because of this, the synthetic pheromones that we use now can be, um, can be used for monitoring and for detection of mountain pine beetle and for management. But there is some uncertainties about the effectiveness of this uh, tool for mountain pine beetle populations when they're at low densities or in novel habitats, such as in Alberta. And th these are the issues that these projects that uh, Nadir and I and all the co-authors and the first page uh, sought to address. Um, so there are two parts of the volatile chemicals that are important for mountain pine beetle. First are the volatiles from the host trees. These are secondary components of the host chemistry. They tend to be monoterpenes, and they are also used as tree defense. And the second part of important, host, of important uh, volatile chemicals are pheromones. These are the beetle-produced volatile chemicals that act as communication uh, between beetles, between mountain pine beetles. So it is these both both of these chemicals together that are important during the key portions of mountain pine beetle life cycle, uh, such as what I've uh, shown here, the dispersal and host selection, and the aggregation and um, the aggregation and host colonization portion of the life cycle. And it is during these two portions of the life cycle that we can exploit the use of uh, these chemicals to monitor and manage mountain pine beetle. Um, so there are three important features of mountain pine beetle and host chemical um, interactions that uh, I'm gonna talk about. First, mountain pine beetle must kill their host tree. And to do that, they need to deal with the toxic chemistry that is in that tree. So they have to overcome that, uh, those toxic chemicals to uh, successfully reproduce. The second uh, feature of bark beetle host tree interactions is that uh, the plant compounds can be used to locate hosts. Uh, for some bark beetles, such as Ips pinei, they can use, utilize these host volatiles to, uh, to locate su uh, suitable hosts. And, uh, but for mountain pine beetle, at least uh, they use a combination of random landing and visual orientation for host location. So those are its host cues. And third, pheromonal communication among bark beetles has been linked with secondary uh, compounds, particularly monoterpenes. So for mountain pine beetle, um, they can convert monoterpenes or a alpha pinene in particular to oxygenated products that serve as aggregation pheromones. And, um, and also there can be de novo synthesis of pheromones that can be stimulated when uh, by the presence of monoterpenes that uh, beetles can um, uh, produce these aggregation pheromones. And it's these pheromones uh, that function in mating, uh, habitat location, uh, uh, counteraction of host defenses, and also resource partitioning. Uh, so I'm going to go through the um, process of how pheromones and tree chemicals are important in the attack of and establishment of beetles in, in a tree. So uh, the mass attack by mountain pine beetle which is required for successful colonization of uh, the tree and overcoming of the tree chemicals, involves complex synergism of host-produced and beetle-produced volatile chemicals. So female uh, beetles 
produce transverbenol. And uh, transverbenol, as I said before, is an uh, oxygenated product of alpha pinene. And transverbenol is preferentially attractive to males. And together, uh, transverbenol and host terpenes, such as myrcene, terpinaline, and threcarine, um, attract more beetles. So during the attack, male produced um, exobrevicomin is attractive to mainly females at low concentrations, but um, exobrevicomin when at high concentrations can also be used to regulate densities. So that attracts more, more beetles in combination with these host terpenes. And interestingly, for mountain pine beetle and some other bark beetles, they do this host switching, which is a way for the beetles to regulate attack density. So when a tree is at an optimal density of uh, beetles that have attacked it, it, um, it means that there's enough beetles to, that have attacked the tree to overcome the defenses, but not so much that competition among them is significant to decrease uh, their brood. They produce anti-aggregation pheromones, and these are used to push attacks to uh, nearby trees, and this is why we see um, pockets of mountain pine beetle infested trees. And these anti-aggregation pheromones are frontalin and verbenone. So because of the chemical ecology of mountain pine beetle, the, uh, there has been development of semiochemical based tools and protocols to detect and monitor populations of mountain pine beetle. And uh, they tend to use aggregation pheromones. And uh, one of the tools have been uh, baited trees. And that's um, this trap tree is the picture that I'm showing here. Um, but they're also, uh, so that can be used for detection and monitoring, but there's also been research in using this as a direct control to reduce populations and manage level of tree mortality from bark beetle. And uh, in Alberta, there's a combination of uh, traps, which is that middle photo, so that's a flight intercept trap, and trap trees that are used as part of a uh, monitoring and detection um, operational tactics for mountain pine beetle management. And these are used in the leading edge zone. That's the red in the map there. And this is uh, from 2017. I put this map up because it kind of more reflects when we did this um, research. And what they do is they put on a, a two-part beetle pheromone uh, bait, and the two parts are transverbenol and exobrevicomin. And uh, these uh, bait sites are set up in each township in the leading edge zone. And to understand the tactics and tools, um, oh, to understand the effectiveness of these tactics and tools in the expanded range, we uh, conducted a few studies uh, to provide data on the optimal lure, on the trap tree configuration, along with data on whether mountain pine beetle attraction to pheromones and tree volatiles vary with local populations in the novel host, in the novel uh, habitat. And that's where I get to my three main objectives that I'll talk about in this, in this talk. And the first one is uh, our, the, um, objective for our first study was to uh, test the efficacy of attractants in the study area that's indicated in that map. And so circled is the Fox Creek, White Court, Swan Hills area. So that's, that's where our study area is. So first was to improve lures. Second was to develop a protocol for monitoring or detection mountain pine beetle using um, trap trees, like what the government um, uses. And the third is to identify whether local population densities of mountain pine beetle and also the flight period impact mountain pine beetle attraction to its pheromones and host volatiles. So um, first, uh, again, the study area is kind of the Swan Hills uh, Mount, uh, White Court 
area in Alberta. And um, this is, I'm pointing this out again because populations are really low in uh, this area. And um, we conducted these tests using the flight intercept traps that you can see in that uh, photo to identify the most effective lure for mountain pine beetle. And this was done in 2014. So to do this, we did two experiments where we used candidate, um, candidate uh, chemicals, uh, uh, volatiles alone and in combination with uh, terpinaline. So we had the two-part uh, pheromone, which is transverbinol and exobrevicomin, with or without terpinaline, and then with one of these um, candidate uh, uh, volatiles. And these were chosen based from the literature and from work done in Nadir, uh, Nadir's lab. So three carrying uh, Nadir found was attractive in um, novel habitat. And uh, another example is Mertinol has been uh, found to be a component of bark beetles, including mountain pine beetle, but the response to this is not really known. And then myrcene and terpinaline are known synergists for uh, the uh, mountain pine beetle aggregation pheromones. And earlier studies in BC have uh, shown that terpinaline and myrcene together work as good synergists, but the effectiveness has not really been shown in uh, the novel habitats uh, such as Alberta. So here I'm presenting the uh, mean captures per trap day for one of our experiments. So this was just the uh, pheromone plus one of the candidate volatiles. <clears throat> and you can see that there were very, very low number of beetles that we caught in that most of our treatments did not catch any beetles. But, and so therefore nothing here is significantly different. But we did find the trend that pheromone plus terpinaline or pheromone plus myrcene caught beetles. And um, this is important because either one of these can be used as a synergist portion of the mountain pine beetle uh, lure. And then in the second experiment that was at the same time as the first experiment, but in a different um, area, we took the standard lure, which is made up of pheromones plus terpinaline, and uh, tested them by adding other components, these uh, candidate uh, volatiles. And again, this was not, uh, there wasn't a significant difference uh, between these treatments because, again, populations were very low. So we caught really low number of beetles and therefore we got a lot of uh, variation. But the standard lure plus myrcene captured greater than 50% um, more beetles in total than other lures. So this combination of terpinaline and myrcene with the two component lures is um, the most effective that we found in this um, experiment. And also, interestingly, it's uh, sold by Synergy Semiochemical as um, what they call a California blend for mountain pine beetle. And um, furthermore, this also supports studies in BC that found the combination of these two also work um, as a good synergist uh, for, the, um, for the pheromones. So we took um, this lure uh, with the pheromones plus terpinaline and myrcene, and we attached them to uh, trap trees in the low populations of mountain pine beetle around the white court area. And this is a picture of one of our trap trees with the, uh, the lure with the um, lures stapled on them. And so the procedure for this was. Um, was we set up different configurations. So that's a square or triangle, square, and rectangle, which had three, four, or six um, baited trees, respectively, in different areas around the, our study area, which is kind of the Fox Creek to Swan Hills area. And we spaced these treatments, um, or these configurations, uh, at different distances. So we had one kilometer, two kilometer, and um, 
and eight kilometers. And we chose the eight kilometer um, here because that kind of reflects the rough estimate of what the government uses with the townships. And the whole purpose of this was to determine like the optimal number of baits per site, the configuration and the distance, all to try to um, determine the best protocol for an Alberta scenario of uh, novel habitat. We found in the 2015 um, uh, year that we did this, that over 90% of the baited trees were, were colonized and about 21% of those were mass attacked. And when I say mass attacked, those are just using the Rafa and Berryman uh, cutoff of about, I think it's like 32 uh, attacks per meter squared. And um, we found that when we looked at the number of attack trees or the um, uh, proportion of attacked uh, trap trees, uh, we did not find the, an effect of the formation nor the distance, but when we just looked at the proportion of trap trees that were um, mass attacked or the number that were mass attacked, we did find a significant effect of the formation. So here we found that rectangle, so six trap trees in a grid formation um, had the um, lowest proportion of uh, mass attacked uh, trap trees, whereas the square kind of had more, but the square and triangle were similar. So formation it was important for trap tree attack, so effectiveness or sensitivity of that trap tree. Next, we also looked at the um, spillovers. So spillover here is just the uh, trees that were unbaited that were surrounding the trap tree. And most of the spillover happened within about 10 meters, though we surveyed uh, 50 meters uh, radius around each one of the trap trees. But again, they were all within maximum of about 10 meters. And this was important because we're interested in the concentration of attacks because we would want to minimize the amount of spillover because operationally this would um, just uh, take this would be more money uh, to deal with these trees when uh, you, because they have to be dealt with before the brood are, um, the brood emerge. So we would want to minimize that. So here we found the proportion spillover trees um, was uh, explained by the formation and the distance, but not the interaction of those. So in the formation, we found that rectangle had the so that six trap trees had the largest proportion of spillover trees, whereas the um, distance we found um, that the eight kilometers had the lowest proportion of spillover trees. So in um, 2016, we uh, we conducted this study again, but we just showed but we just chose the square formation because we we're interested in the um, whether the distance could uh, impact this concentration effect, could constant could impact the uh, spillover trees. And we found when we looked at the eight kilometer and we added another one of a 12 kilometer that they weren't different, that the number of trap trees attacked, and the spillover uh, of uh, beetles onto unbaited trees were the same at eight kilometer and 12 kilometer. And this indicates that using eight kilometers or greater distance between trap tree baited sites, um, using at least the square formation, it's sensitive and effective protocol for trap trees in, in low populations. So the trap trees study indicates that formation and distance can impact the effectiveness of concentrating beetles into a baited stand. And it's the, um, the continuous release of these attractive compounds from the baits on these uh, trees likely overrides the effect of anti-aggregation pheromones produced by mated beetles and thus concentrates attacks onto, into a baited stand and tree. Furthermore, 
we showed that population densities of mountain pine beetle can be uh, detected using mountain pine beetle because we found that the range of attack densities was ranged from massively mass attacked to just one or two attacks per tree. So this indicates that beetle population density varied within our study area. And uh, finally, that trap tree tool is useful in this novel habitat, um, that is Alberta. And uh, that along with uh, delineating geographic distributions and showing potential sources of beetles that this trap tree tool can be a technique to detect beetles and also pot potentially understand uh, relative densities of beetles during the year of attack. And during year of attack is important because um, aerial detection surveys usually have a one year lag in determining what the population is of mountain pine beetle or where mountain pine beetle is. Whereas using the trap tree technique, you uh, identify the year of um, that attack because you have to revisit it uh, that same year you put the trees out. So that makes this uh, an effective tool for, for Alberta's uh, detection and monitoring of mountain pine beetle. So in the next study, so as I said uh, before in that last study, we found um, a lot of variation in the density of uh, mountain pine beetle populations in that study area. And the variation in, um, in attraction that we found led us to set up a three-year study to help understand mountain pine beetle attraction to its pheromone and tree volatiles. And to see whether that was density dependent. Uh, and this is important that um, this is all, all in a pre-outbreak uh, situation of mountain pine beetles. So these are all pretty low populations in our, in our study area. So I'm showing you these graphs because it's earlier work in BC showed that increasing release rates of pheromones in uh, tree and tree volatiles can improve attraction. So these uh, studies reported that mountain pine beetle exhibit dose-dependent response to cis-transverbinol. That's, that's what these graphs are showing in areas with low population numbers. So increasing release rates of, uh, and also increasing release rates of exobrevicomin had no effect on mountain pine beetle. It's these verbinols, this uh, transverbinol, that did have a, a density dependent um, effect. And um, in areas, so that, that's looking at the right graph and the left graph in areas with high populations that were studied in BC, uh, they found uh, the response was directly proportional to the release rate, suggesting beetle attraction to its aggregation pheromone varies depending on its population size. So we wanted to take this, there we go. We wanted to take this and set up a study in Alberta to identify density dependence in attraction and also see how attraction varied over the flight period in Alberta. So the overall uh, purpose was to develop two types, like the overall goal of this was to develop two types of lures to monitor mountain pine beetle activities at low and high uh, densities, uh, density populations in the sub outbreak um, area uh, in Alberta, in the expanded range. And when I say high, it just is in relative terms, because again, overall, the populations uh, were pretty low. So in this same study area, as we did all the other experiments, so in the white court area, we set up flight intercept traps in areas with varying levels of mountain pine beetle uh, populations estimated from the previous year's aerial detection survey. And the buffer we used was seven kilometer radius of trap sites. Is the, that was the uh, population of local uh, beetles that we used to estimate. So we wanted to know whether attraction varied with uh, density based on either uh, beetle produced pheromones or tree chemicals. Therefore, we had four treatments. The first is um, standard 
uh, commercially available uh, release rates of transverbinol exobrevicomin plus our um, terpinaline plus myrcene um, components. So that's the standard release rates. And then we doubled the mountain pine beetle uh, pheromone, just the transverbinol, because as I said earlier, exobrevicomin did not um, change attraction. So we have the double mountain pine beetle, and then we doubled just the tree component. So that's the terpene and, and myrcene. And finally, we doubled both. So those are our four um, treatments that we used. These figures are of the mountain pine beetle catches over time for each one of the treatments separated into what I call high and low populations. So high is on top and low populations are on the bottom. But again, these are all like sub um, outbreak. Uh, and this is only for 2017 and I'll show the, um, the other years later. And you can see each line is each one of our treatments. So the standard is dark blue, the double mountain pine beetle is orange. The yellow is the double trees uh, chemicals and the light blue is both. We just, I just wanted to show these as visualization to show that the catches varied over the period that we collected. So for 2017, we collected over um, five weeks and that this varied over time where most of the beetles were caught within the first three weeks. And this was true for 2017 and also for 2018, except for this large in-flight that you see. So on August 15th, we had this um, large in-flight. I think it was, uh, we saw that it was in August 14th, actually, is when the in-flight happened, where we caught 2,301 mountain pine beetle in all of our traps, which represents 75% of all the beetles we caught over the six weeks. So um, this was kind of an aberration. And so uh, we focused just on the first three weeks for analysis. And then finally, in 2019, we just took the, the best performing uh, treatments uh, for the highest and the lowest populations of mountain pine beetle and tested those in uh, two sites that represented high and low populations. So you can see here standard and uh, the double mountain pine beetle were the treatments we use. And again, most of the beetles we caught were in the first three weeks. This is the uh, just representing the uh, number of mean number of beetles per trap in the first three weeks of um, the flight period. And the x axis here is the population density from the aerial detection survey. <clears throat> and for both years, we found that lure was a significant uh, predictor of the number of beetles per trap, and so was the lure by aerial detection survey interaction, indicating that the effect of the lure was, or traction to the lure was different, was dependent on the population de uh, density or estimate from the ADS. And um, in this, we can see that the standard um, performed well at high population densities, and the two mountain pine beetle performed well at low population densities for both years. We took that treatment, and in 2019, we only tested those two, and we tested them in two different sites with differing populations, again, based on the aerial detection survey. We found that the pattern uh, maintained so that at high populations, uh, mountain pine beetle was, uh, we caught more mountain pine beetle using the standard uh, lure, the standard release rate lure, whereas at lower populations, we found the double mountain pine beetle performed pretty well. And again, we found that lure, the attractiveness of lure was dependent on this uh, population density. This shows that attractiveness of these aggregation pheromones differed with local population 
uh, density of mountain pine beetle during the first portion of the flight period. And I didn't show the uh, graphs for the last portion of the flight period, but we did not find an effect of lure or aerial detection survey, and nor did we find the same patterns um, for attraction. So that um, the, um, the flight period, uh, the attractiveness to these lures changed over the flight period. So, at low populations, we found greater aggregation pheromone, um, so the double mountain, uh, the double transverbinol allows them potentially to find attacked hosts more effectively to mass attack and overcome ali effects at these low populations. Whereas higher populations, uh, but again, sub -out outbreak populations, um, having a preference for the low transverbinol. Uh, so the standard level may promote colonization of a larger number of trees rather just uh, rather than just over attacking only a few heavily infested trees. We also found that there was a lack of synergism or uh, by the tree chemicals because we also had that double tree chemical um, treatment. We found that this may indicate that beetles are avoiding these highly defended uh, trees and also that um, mountain pine beetle offspring from low populations have been uh, found in studies in BC to prefer hosts with low monoterpene concentrations compared to offspring that were from uh, outbreak populations. Uh, this indicates that natal experience uh, uh, or even the impact of the mother's environment may relate to these uh, preferences for low host volatiles. In conclusion, that these results from these studies suggest that the two component pheromone, so that's transverbinol plus exobrevicomin, plus the terpinaline and myrcene can be used to effectively monitor and detect mountain pine beetle activities in, uh, with uh, flight intercept traps and with a trap tree uh, program in Alberta in a novel habitat. And that um, another an implication of this work also is that potentially manipulating transverbinol to take advantage of the density dependent responses of mountain pine beetle uh, may be able to develop in, into tools to meet a number of different management objectives. For example, uh, using attractants with a range of release rates of transverbinol may be informative to monitor emerging incipient epidemic populations, or if beetle populations are high enough that operational control is needed, then you would want to use standard level of transverbinol. And so that would be the most important, the lower level of transverbinol. Whereas if populations are really low, such as in the leading edge of mountain pine beetles eastern spread, then a higher release rate of transverbinol may be more effective at detecting uh, mountain pine beetle presence. Um, also, these studies indicate that um, along with using a bait with both synergistic host volatiles, uh, focusing on the first portion of the flight period would take advantage of the greater sensitivity to transverbinol uh, by mountain pine beetle. So focusing on that first portion of flight would be important for your monitoring and detecting uh, uh, tactics. And finally, also the volatiles uh, emitted by blue stain fungi. I didn't mention any of uh, those before, but the beetle brings along uh, fungi that help overcome the tree defenses in trees. And in our lab, we've been finding that um, we've been doing, looking at the chemicals that these host fungi emit, and um, they may be important cues for attraction of previously unsuccessful attack trees or trees continually attacked by mountain pine beetle. And this could be a new focus for, again, refining and making the most effective attraction lure uh, for mountain pine beetle for management purposes. 
And with that, um, I'd like to thank you for listening and thank to the funders and all the people who supported this work and did this work and um, any questions.